Hi, I'm Corinne Gasper, and I'm the director of Jennifer's Messengers, and I'm here today to talk with Ed. He's a friend, but he's also a, an advocate like I am against uh, DUID. Um, Ed Wood founded DUID Victims um, after the death of his 33-year-old son, Brian, at the hands of two impaired drivers on marijuana, methamphetamine, and heroin. He has a BS in chemistry, an MBA, and is retired um, from the medical as a medical device executive. Ed has worked with victims, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, clinicians, drug recognition experts, law enforcement officers, toxicologists, legislators, state officials, and an international list of researchers and other specialists in his quest to increase public knowledge on DUID. Ed wrote Colorado's 2017 law requiring the state to collect and report data on drug impaired driving. He is a frequent speaker and an author of several peer reviewed publications on the subject of impaired drug impaired driving and more and more currently in review. Hi Ed, how are you today? I'm excellent, Corinne. Good to be Good. With you. Good. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, and I'm so happy that you're willing to talk to us on this very important topic. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what happened that got you so involved in this issue? Sure. My, my son, Brian, was killed by drug and fair drivers, as you mentioned, 11 years ago now. Uh, this, this is a uh, picture of Brian and, and his wife uh, the year before he was killed. They had been married about five years and they were going to uh, spend the weekend in a vacation home owned by Aaron's parents but a car coming the other direction had different ideas and they, that car was filled with four drug users. Two of them were at the wheel. Both of them were charged with vehicular homicide caused by driving under the influence of drugs. Their car was upside down and airborne when it went through Brian's windshield killing him instantly. Aaron fortunately was saved as was her baby, not yet born. She was in utero at the time. Um, we do have, fortunately, Sierra with us, oh. who's uh, what we have to uh, remember by, Brian by. I went to the, every day of the trial, those two women, and went to most days when they had uh, various hearings as well. And I learned that the laws that are put in place to provide some semblance of justice to victims of alcohol and impaired driving don't work very well for victims of drug and impaired driving. Mm. I didn't know why that was. So I set about to try to learn. I set about to try to learn why the laws are not better than they are right now. It's very difficult to convict someone of DUID. And uh, we're making a little bit of progress in some areas now, but. Uh, We'll, we'll talk about that as we go through this, this discussion. But I learned that uh, things have to change. So I've dedicated my life since, since then to see what can be done to educate people into the real risks of drug impaired driving and how to deal with it. Yeah, because it is an issue that involves everybody. Everybody has to drive on our roads to get from place yeah. to place and everybody should be more concerned about it because you know this is something that happens in the blink of an eye. And, you know, we lose, we lose people that are very important in our lives because of other people using drugs and driving. And it's just yeah. really awful. And I understand what you said about the court issue. Um, I found that same thing when I was going through, um, you know, the courts with my daughter's case. So I know what you mean. The, the laws do not feel like they protect us, the victims. Uh, it feels just the opposite. In fact, the man that actually killed my daughter did not have any drug charges at the end of all of this. So it was yeah. quite shocking to me. That's and we fresh. think that we think that's because he wanted to keep his medical marijuana card. So mm -hmm. it all worked out for him that way. Yep. So, you know, I know this is a multifaceted faceted issue. And um, but what is the most important aspect of this issue to you and why? Well, I'll, I'll mention uh, actually five things that I think are really important for people to realize. First of all, DUI is not just about alcohol. 
And DUID is not just about marijuana. That's point number one. Point number two is polydrug impairment, which is impairment by two or more drugs, is both more common and more dangerous than impairment by marijuana's THC alone. Third thing people need to realize is that DUID is underreported. We do need better data. It's coming slowly, but even in Colorado where we've really tried to improve our data, we're still far from where we ought to be. The fourth is that the average risk of a crash for a THC impaired driver is understated. It is much more dangerous than what most published literature would have you believe. We can tell you why that is. And the fifth thing is that we cannot deal with DUID the same way we deal with alcohol. THC is not like alcohol, chemically, biologically, and metabolically. No one should even think that you should be able to use the same tools for THC that you can for alcohol. And in fact, you cannot. So those are, those, those are the five aspects. Let, let's go back and talk about each one just a little bit more in depth here. I said that DUI is not just about alcohol. About 75% of all the uh, DUI cases in Colorado are listed as alcohol only. And part of that's because they're tested only with breath testing, which does not test for drugs. So we don't really know how many of those are polydrugs. About one fourth are caused by drugs. Of those caused by drugs, about one third are caused by THC, marijuana's THC, and two thirds is polydrugs. What's the most common polydrug? It turns out it's alcohol and THC combined. There was a study done by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation where they had taken 500 vials of blood where they had uh, just randomly, you know, that they had kept in their, their archive and they tested those bloods that previously had only been tested for alcohol. They decided to test them for the full panel of drugs. Hmm. 78% Oof. had drugs on board. So when we say 75% of DOI is about alcohol, it probably is much, much lower than that. Hmm. Drugs wow. are much more, much more common than what people realize. And it's mostly polydrugs. Secondly, I said the polydrug impairment is more common than THC impairment, and it's also more dangerous. Well, here's some crash data that we have from looking at people that were convicted of DUI. And this is from a three-year period in the state of Colorado now. For those that are unimpaired, an unimpaired person, uh, they have about a 2.9% chance of being in a crash in any one year. That's what our CDOT will tell us. But those people that are convicted <coughs> of impairment by THC and THC alone, it's a little over 7%. Gosh. Alcohol, 25%. Polydrug, 28%. So polydrug is more deadly and more common than THC impairment. Third point I want to come back to is that T DOID is underreported. We need better data. I told you what we one one uh, point that uh, tells us that uh, maybe the majority of uh, alcohol only cases may actually be polydrug. But you see, we don't test everybody. We only test about two thirds of the people that we arrest because one third of the people in our state refuse to comply with the express consent law. So we go to court and have to convict them based upon DUI statute, not based upon DUI per se statute. Just to clarify what that, what that means, to be convicted of DUI, the officer has to have behavioral evidence that the person was impaired. To be convicted of DUI per se, you have to have chemical evidence that they're above the 0.08 threshold. Right. Two, two, two different laws. Turns out we have about the same level of conviction rate for uh, people that have uh, toxicology data as we have for those that do not have any toxicology data. So we can convict on either one. We hmm. don't have to do that. 
The fourth one is that the average risk of a crash for THC impaired drivers is underreported. If you look at most literature that has been done, they will tell you that the crash rate is about double for somebody that's on THC. That is, if somebody has been smoking marijuana recently, they'll have double the chance of being in a crash. Right. And it turns out there's a very wide variance in what the, the reports will tell you. Some reports are as low as it's not double, it's actually the other way. It's about you're five times safer to be on THC. The number is 0.22. The other extreme, it's 13 times uh, more dangerous. So there's a huge discrepancy. One of the reasons for discrepancy is that the, the pool that they're testing, how they're testing, uh, how the, the, the study was set up. But there's something else that's more insidious. They're looking at averages. They're looking at averages of people that are, some will be very mildly impaired or maybe not impaired at all. And some will be highly impaired. And the average is gonna be in the middle and then it averages about twice as risky. What we've now found is that if you take a look at those that are convicted in the state of Colorado of impaired driving, where THC was the only drug found, their relative risk is about seven to 10 times that of a, of a uh, unimpaired driver. So what we've been hearing from scientific literature, from the media and everybody else, it understates what the real risk is for impairment by THC and THC alone. And remember, polydrug impairment is even worse. And the last point I mentioned was that mm. we cannot deal with DUID the same way we deal with DUI alcohol. It's because we cannot use the levels of THC to determine how impaired somebody is. There is no relationship whatsoever between the amount of uh, THC in somebody's blood and how impaired they are. It's so bad, it is so bad that within the thir first 30 minutes of beginning to smoke a joint, your THC levels will be declining at the same time your perceived feeling of being high is increasing. During that first 30 minutes as well, actually the numbers, the first 25 minutes, the average drop between the maximum THC level in blood will go down 79% in 25 minutes. 79% loss. That's within 25 minutes, but it takes typically an hour for a routine stop before you can get a blood sample. Two hours if there's a death or a serious bodily injury, and three hours if the policeman needs to get a warrant to get the blood sample. So with those kinds of delays, there's no way that the toxicology results will reflect what the level of THC was at the time of the incident that led to the requirement that the blood be tested. So you just, just cannot use the same DUI per se tools for THC that we can use for alcohol. We have to rely upon trained officers that can detect what the level of impairment really is through behavioral symptoms. Now, the good news is we're pretty, pretty good at that. If we look at the conviction rates in Colorado now, uh, we can look at them, we, we can break it down in two different ways. About one third of the states in this country define DUI or OWI or DUII or whatever their initials are, they, they, they vary, but they, they have a definition. There are two definitions that are being used. One, you are impaired to the slightest degree. The second is that you are incapable of safe driving. About one third of the states have the impaired to the slightest degree. Ohio does, your state has that, for example. Hmm. State like Texas will have a state uh, law that says you have to be incapable of safe driving. Colorado has both. It's the only state that has that. <laughs> so we can, now, we can now look at this, we can say, okay, Let's, what happens if we have somebody that is uh, impaired by THC and THC only? Let's keep it real simple. There's no polydrug involvement here whatsoever. And if they have five nanograms or greater of THC in their blood, we have a 70% conviction rate for DUI. That's not particularly good because for alcohol, it's about 88%. 70% mm -hmm. isn't too shabby. What if we look at the other definition? 
What about those, those people that are charged with DWAI, which is the impairment to the slightest degree? 99% conviction rate. Hmm. Hmm. How about those people that are below five nanograms? Well, for DUI, we have a 9% conviction rate. Almost wow. nobody's convicted from DUI. How about for DWAI? Again, the impairment to the slightest degree. 93%. So people that are below five nanograms or above five nanograms, it doesn't make any difference. They are unsafe to drive, okay? They are impaired. And we, we, we've proven that with our conviction rate. If you have a five nanogram law, you are protecting those people from conviction. If you use a uh, five nanogram per cell limit, but you don't have to convict on it. You don't have to convict on it per se. You have those options, those other options. The problem is that if you have a five nanogram per se, the courts will say, "Gee, you're below five nanograms." So, yeah, you may have think you may think this person is impaired, but you probably isn't because he's below five nanograms. Colorado's five nanogram law only applies to the uh, the, the DOI, the, the most egregious form. It does not apply to DWAI impairment to the slightest degree. So the five nanogram doesn't even come into play there. Mm. That's why we can get a 93% conviction rate. And that's why we cannot get a decent conviction rate for DOI because the five nanogram law, it's in the way. But since then you've done, you've done some work with the law, right? To help get these numbers, you've created something yes. very important. So can you tell us a little bit about what, the, what you've done with legislation? Yeah, I, 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 I'd be glad to, uh, Karina, that was, that's one of the few things I've done that's actually been very successful in, in, my, in my quest. Mm -hmm. in, in 2017, I, I drafted a law and was able to get it passed unanimously through the legislature to require the state to collect and to publish uh, data on the causes and consequences of drug impaired driving. And they do this by getting data from the courts, data from the toxicology labs, and data from the probation department. By probation department, you ask. Well, between toxicology and the courts, you can find out what uh, people are being convicted of based upon what chemistry, what chemical they had in their body. Hmm. The probation department also has data on the numbers of crashes that these people have, so we can find out how uh, how risky uh, it, it is for somebody to be on THC alone, poly drugs, and alcohol. Those numbers I gave you earlier. Those come from our, our probation department. So this, these are all yes. now published all together in one report. But getting that report done was, uh, was a major coup. And the report is a very lengthy report. It's about typically about 80 or 90 pages, something like that, when it comes out every year. And we're the only state that does that. No other state that I'm aware of has that kind of information. And I also know you've done a lot with the driver's education program in your state, which I think probably needs updating in most states. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what you found and, and how you actually got something done, possibly? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say possibly, I know it's difficult <laughs> to work within these agencies. Yeah, there's actually a, a, a little bit of progress there and I think we're gonna see a lot more progress if, uh, if the current trends continue. But interesting stories to how that came about. Uh, it, it occurred to me that, you know, we have a, a lot of, of youth in our state that are getting involved with drugs at a very early age, unfortunately, and they start driving at an early age and they put those yeah. together and you got a recipe for disaster. I said, well, wait a minute, what, what kind of information are they getting to, to already know about uh, what drug and drug driving is all about? Well, you know, every state has a driver handbook. You've got one in your state, every state has one. It may be published by the Department of Transportation. Ours is published by the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, under which is a, a branch of the uh, Department of Revenue, because that's where they, they collect money. That's where ours is. So I looked at our driver's handbook, and it said in there, uh, you know, even though it is known that THC will cause symptoms that will impair driving, it is not clear whether or not THC causes an Increase in traffic crashes. And I said, that's, I read that and I said, I, I couldn't believe that. That's, a, that's just factually wrong. How can they say yes. that? Yes. So, well, they said that because they were quoting the CDC of all people. The mm. CDC did say that. 
I said, what? That's, that's stupid. I mean, that's, that's factually wrong. I got a hold of the CDC and I said, this is wrong. <laughs> and they said, you're right, it's wrong. We're publishing an update. It'll come out in a couple of weeks. And it did. The update said, that's great. When you have THC, you do increase your chance of, of a crash. So I took that piece of paper and I went back to the Department of Revenue and I said, okay, now please change your driver handbook because it's based upon something that even CDC says is wrong. Incidentally, CDC still has not uh, taken down their previously incorrect statement. It's still up on their website. They have both a correct statement and an incorrect statement, but that's, <laughs> that's the federal government for it. So anyway, so I go back to the uh, Department of Revenue and said, uh, okay, uh, get this changed. And they said, oh, we can't. So I went to the director of the Department of Revenue. And he said, well, my people tell me we've always, always had that statement in there. I said, no, they really haven't. Here's what you had the previous year and you didn't have that. You just put that in last year, why? And it's wrong. He said, hmm, I've been misled by my own people. I better go check into this. He did and he came back, he said, Mr. Wood, you're right. We're going to change it. Within one week, it was changed online. Hey. And he said, by the way, you will now be on the staff of people that will be providing input into drafting the next version of the driver handbook. Wow. So we've been, we've been doing that, and we, we've uh, completed the first pass on that. Uh, did that uh, just uh, two weeks ago. We're expecting to have it completed to be published by the end of this year. And when it is published, it will have good information that I have in there describing what the, the facts are on drug impaired driving, not just marijuana, but poly drug impaired driving as well. So I feel very, very good about that. Once that's available, what I hope to do is to take that out to all other states and say, you know, here's a model you might consider because you have some youth that are being miseducated because there's no good information out there for them to lean on to understand what this problem really is. So that, that's, that's a, a success story that's still in the making. That is a huge success story. Um, I've tried to do some work here and I haven't been able to even crack open a door. So that, that's really amazing, Ed. You're really, you're making a difference, a big difference. You know, cracking open the door, Corinne, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Um, yeah. You probably have found what I found. Uh, you try something and you get no response. You get yes. A, sometimes they won't open the door. Sometimes they'll slam the door in your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, I, I tried the, I've tried the same thing with the driver's education. Uh, we we uh, have, like many other states do, no longer do driver's education in high school. The driver's education is had, uh, performed now by professional driving schools. That's right. All, all professional driving schools developed their curriculum based upon some kind of a guidelines coming from the American Drivers Training and Safety uh, Education Association. So I said, well, great, I'll go to that association and see if I can look at their guidelines. And the guidelines are okay, but they're pretty weak and they don't really cover drug driving well at all. It's more or less a, an afterthought. They, they, they cover alcohol and pair driving very competently. Drug driving is just maybe a paragraph here and there. So I said, let's, let's change their, their, their protocol to begin with. And uh, I can't get them to answer the phone. I, I, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't take a lot of changes to improve what they have. They don't answer the phone. They don't answer emails. They don't uh, answer letters. Uh, they don't seem to really care. Well, so what do you do? You've had the same problem. You get, yes. you knock on a door and nobody answers. Well, let me go t talk to the people that are writing the textbooks. Well, it turns out they're two major textbook uh, publishers. One is Prentice Hall, the other one is AAA. Uh, the Prentice Hall, the lady that wrote that, died several years ago, and nobody else in Prentice Hall seems to be interested in making an update, and so I can't get, I get a closed door there as well, just, just like what you've got. Right. AAA's been better. AAA said, uh, I actually wrote a chapter for them. I said, this is what you ought to include in your book. And I gave that to them, and I heard back from them. They said, thank you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so will something happen? I, I doubt it, but it might. I'm now working with a company that plans to do an online training textbook. 
maybe that will be more successful. I don't know. We'll see. And you, you said that you gave that to them approximately a year ago. So I gave that to them about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I so, mean, you, it, I, I just think when you come at it from all those different angles, you know, you, you're going to win in the end. I, I really believe that. But I like you right said, right. you, you don't believe that? I, I, said, I, hope, I hope you're, I hope you're oh, right. Oh, I, I hope, hope right. you do too. <laughs> I mean, you have done so much to really impact the education about impaired driving. It's amazing. I wish, you know, I do speak at some of these driver schools and um, because I've called them and asked them, uh, you know, about their, about yeah. their drug education. And it's, there's like two lines and yeah. they mention drugs. They don't specifically mention marijuana, you know, so a lot of people do not consider marijuana a drug, even though it is an hallucinogenic drug. You know, and it's there's so like you said, there's so much mis misinformation out there today. Well, that, that's true. That let me tell you a story about a uh, an officer that arrested someone uh, shortly after marijuana was legalized in the, the state. They arrested this this lady that was uh, badly impaired. Uh, she had killed uh, somebody in, in another car, uh, severely injured somebody else, and the policeman said, "Well, okay." Ma'am, I'm going to have to take you in. You are impaired by drugs, impaired by marijuana. Smell it on you. And you've admitted you had marijuana just before you drove. Yes. And you may have behaved that way. The evidence right there. And her response was, well, you can't do that. Marijuana is legal now. It's not even a drug anymore. <laughs> we had another person call up uh, the... Uh, the head of the Colorado uh, Division of uh, Prosecuting Attorneys and uh, said, you know, we have a right to drive stone and it's not dangerous. Oh my gosh. Guess what people believe? They also believe, Ed, to go along <laughs> with what you're saying there, that if they have a medical marijuana card, that actually their doctor said it's okay for them to drive impaired. My doctor <laughs> gave me this card. It's okay for me to, uh, no. <laughs> Doctor didn't say that. He did not prescribe no. it. And if the doctor did say that, uh, I would love to have that down documented because that doctor can then be brought up on charges. Well, they just assume that because they were given a medical marijuana card that that gives them a free license. And that is, that is another reason I get so concerned about legalizing marijuana because it kind of tells our youth in our country, well, that it must be okay. So it is very well, concerning the messages that go along with that. Uh, it, it part, partly it's okay because the, the press tells them it's okay. The, the press will uh, will carry water for the marijuana lobby, and they do this uh, quite regularly. And as a result, we have a good number of myths that are out there that people believe. And we, are, we need to do our best to try to combat these myths. Let me just go through a few of them, if, if you don't mind. Okay. I, yes, I, please. This, this may be interesting. One that I, I hear quite frequently was the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration did a study a few years ago. And they prove that there is no link between crash risk and marijuana use. I've heard this was uh, presented uh, to uh, several legislative committees in Colorado. I've seen it in print. I've seen it lots of places. Here's the truth. NHTSA did do, publish a study. They found no link between crash risk and any drug use other than alcohol, including heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, benzodiazepine, and THC, even though all those other uh, drugs have been shown to be more dangerous than THC. You need to remember that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's like when you can't find your car keys, it doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. It doesn't mean you didn't look in the right place. The problem with this study, they didn't look in the right place. The study had basic fundamental flaws. Mm. Let me tell you what some of the flaws were. They only studied volunteers. They did not study everybody that was involved in a crash. Why, you ask, would somebody who knew that they were stoned volunteer to be studied? They didn't. If you only use the volunteers, you're going to get skewed results. Secondly, they included in their study pool people that were not just the people that caused the crash, but at least 431 of the people were there were uh, innocent victims. They, they were victims of the crash. They happened to be in another of the car. 
the uh, the study pool uh, basically was uh, biased to less severe crashes. There are no freeway crashes in there at all. And the study pool was too small to have provided statistically valid sample. The study was done in a study in a city in Virginia Beach that had a very low drug use to begin with, whereas the average at that time was about 19% in the population. In Virginia Beach, it was 14% at that same time. So oh all kinds gosh. of problems that says, this yes. study was just a flawed study. Yes. But this it, therefore it's a gospel. No. My prejudice is if the government did it, it's probably wrong. You better to be deeper and find out what the problems were. It's wrong. Another thing we hear is that uh, marijuana users are safe drivers. They actually slow down if they're, if they're better drivers. Well, we know that's not true. But we know that's not true, and you know that very, very clearly. Why do people believe that? Well, part of it is because of some of these old stoner movies and so forth, uh, Cheech and Chong movies and things of that sort. Uh, part of it is, is because there have been some studies where people have been put on driving simulators and they put them on, test them once, and then they go out there, they dose themselves with uh, drugs, THC, alcohol, whatever it happens to be, and come back in and do it again. When they do that, interestingly enough, the people on alcohol typically drive faster in the simulator. People mm -hmm. in THC typically drive slower. If they're observed, they drive slower. But that's not how they drive in the real world. Right. State patrols in California, Colorado, other places will tell you that the number one reason that they arrest somebody that's eventually convicted of DUI for marijuana alone speeding. is speeding. Yeah. But it's because of what they get with this observed case, where somebody knows that they're they're being observed, they will slow down, and they will do that because they're being stoned is not like being drunk. Right. When you're stoned, you are aware of your your situation much more than somebody who's on alcohol. Hmm. What if you're on both? All bets are off. Right. It's worse than alcohol. And then throw in another drug or two, right? Which is yeah. what they tend to do. Another thing, driving stone is safer than driving drunk. Well, on the average it is, but nobody's average. You're either above average or below average. And somebody who is, has a high dose of THC will be more impaired and more dangerous than someone on a low dose of alcohol. On average, you're right. THC is less dangerous than drunk driving. But that does not occur for everybody. Well, Ed, you had give, have given us numerous things to think about. And I mean, I I just can't even um, imagine what all the things that you've had to deal with to come up with all of this. I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there that has had these accomplishments like you have. It's amazing. And it's made me aware of my own state um, and what we need to do here and in every state. But I guess I'll start with my own and, and with mm -hmm. your help, maybe we can get some things accomplished here as well. What, what would you like to leave us with? What, what are your words of wisdom that you feel that you would like, you know, to end this with? Yeah, well, I, I will say uh, this is a very complicated issue. Don't listen to the marijuana lobby. Look at the facts. Dig to find out what the real facts are. Get the data if you can in your own state. Educate yourself. Spend some time seeing if once we have a new driver handbook out uh, from Colorado, see if you can do the same thing in your own state. There are some things that you can do. Spend some time learning what the real issues are. Uh, and care. Care a lot. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, we so much appreciate it. We are we are talking to many different people in our in our podcast and trying to cover all the different areas of impaired driving. And there is a lot of them. And you've added so much for us to think about. So thank you so much, Ed. And, and I look forward to working with you in the future to try to make things better for our state and for all states. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Karine.